Before we begin, would you please join me in confessing Scripture's teachings regarding the Sixth Commandment. What is the Sixth Commandment? What does this mean? And how do we lead a sexually pure and decent life? Conversely, what does God forbid in the Sixth Commandment? What does God require of us in the Sixth Commandment? Grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In addition to the text that we read a moment ago and a couple that were at the beginning of our, with our confession absolution, here's a couple that will be occupying our thoughts as we listen to God. From Psalm 9, the Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. From James 1, don't just listen to God's word, you must do what it says. From Luke 4, the Spirit of the Lord has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released and the oppressed will be set free. And this is one of my favorite uh, passages from Proverbs, Proverbs 31. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those being crushed. Yes, speak up for the poor and the helpless and see that they get justice. So far as the text. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of our hearts, be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Some of you have seen and know some of the statistics, and I won't bore you with all of them, but there are some that occupy us this morning that bear repeating. And the reason that they bear repeating is because we have a tendency that when we see atrocities, we put in our mind that they happen someplace else. That they are not something that we really are struggling with in our own environment, even if it stares us in the face. Houston is a hub for both international and domestic sex trafficking. International women and girls are trafficked via Houston's massage parlors and cantinas. How about this one? There are more strip clubs and illicit spas in Houston than in Vegas. The buying and selling of people is the second largest criminal industry in the world and the fastest growing. This next one that makes my stomach churn. The average age of victims bought and sold for sex is 12 to 13 years old. More humans were enslaved in 2012 than at the height of the African slave trade in the 1800s. This value is from several years ago. The total market value of illicit human trafficking is estimated to be in excess of $32 billion. Sex traffickers control their victims with physical and psychological force, fraud, and coercion. In fact, that Force, fraud, and coercion are a part of the definition of what it means to be trafficked. What in the world happened? 
How in the world did this possibly take place under our noses? I grew up in Houston. I knew the city pretty well, or I thought I did. When I learned of what was going on all around, not just isolated events, I was shocked. I was hurt. I was pierced. The stories that come on what is endured in brothels of how pimps control the women, the degradation, the deceit, the greed, the violence, the treating people as less than cattle. The putting someone else at full risk in many ways simply for the pleasure of another is sickening. And it's happening all around. I am very pleased to know that this word has been getting out, and we hear a lot more about it. We hear about some stings taking place, some people actually brought to trial. But currently, it is a drop in the bucket. I'm going to start with just a couple of things that really lead into what a response needs to be. Because I don't think that anyone here would say that this is something that we're glad exists, that doesn't need to be stopped. I think for the most part, we understand at least enough to say that this is a horrible, terrible thing to have continued rape and abuse of girls and women in our society. And to be so overwhelmed like I was for so long, I, I didn't even know how to verbalize, how to even form a thought. I was so overwhelmed by sadness, by anger, by pain. I didn't even know how to formulate thoughts, let alone any kind of strategy on how to come against it. I had more questions from God on not only why, but how, Lord, will you use me? The first part of response is something that is a part of our responses to every aspect in our sermon series and everything that we do, and it should not surprise. But it is not small. We deal not with flesh and blood, but with the demons and the principalities of this world. That is so evident when you see the darkness that exists. Some women who occupy a space barely larger than a bed mattress and forced to live there. How can we not pray? How can we not seek? I had asked, as I did last week, and got some response from one of my teams, another one of my teams, the one that we are going against sex trafficking. I asked for some feedback and, and all gave some aspects. So one of them who looked up some specific things to pray for when dealing with this madness. I know you can't read that. I'll read it for you. Praying for the safety of those who are trapped in the bonds of slavery. Pray that God would hear their cries and liberate them from the hands of their oppressors. Pray for God to raise up more men and women who are passionate about the cause. Pray for those who tirelessly give to the fight of this injustice. Pray for our national, state, and local leaders that God would strengthen their resolve and stand decisively against the crime of human trafficking and the sexual exploitation of children. 
pray that we as a society would have the moral conviction and the political will to see policies changed, laws enacted to protect the victims of modern day slavery. Yes, Lord, do it. Last spring, a national law was passed, a good law that at least is a step in the right direction. For part of that law, which was overwhelmingly voted in by both houses and by the president, part of it says that it will treat and can be prosecuted a John to the same level and extent as a pimp. This is needed. Because we get into this whole aspect of trying to address and help the women get them rescued, get them educated, get them back into the world. That's the way to stop it. But if you don't stop Johns and you don't make it a serious crime and you go with excuses like boys will be boys, no. That is not acceptable. When we pray, we pray as much for forgiveness as we do for that stamina and that strength. Besides prayer, you need to get educated. A year ago, I had a first screening here at St. Mark for a documentary. A handful of folks showed up. I invited some of the leaders from some of our church bodies, including... Crowsey Center and a couple of our neighboring congregations and Link and some others. And there was a question that was asked of those who were presenting to us. And the question was simply and succinctly put when discussing this in congregations. He says, how do you get past the ick factor? And the answer is as simple as the question. You talk about it. This holy house is a proper and right and sacred area to talk about sin on all levels. And when we explain things here in God's house, they are not anything that he does not already know, has not already heard, and does not already have an answer ready for. But it is a sure and certain way to continue in sin when we feel we can never address it. Save us from this, Lord. A part of our team's duty in addressing this, the first step was to get the team educated, to look at some documentaries, to take a van tour around some of the hotbeds of where most of the brothels are. It was not the first van tour that I had been on. I had been on a few. And this last one, even while we were there, even as we were parked in a van outside of one of the brothels, as we're sitting there hearing a minivan pulls up and around and parks in a parking lot right in front of us with could have been anyone's dad getting out and knocking on the door. doesn't get more plain than that. On some of those van tours put on by Elijah Rising down at the 59 and Chimney Rock area, they have gone by one brothel at a time and one of the people in their van recognized their pastor's car. None are immune. Can you imagine not just the atrocity that takes place, but then the black eye of the gospel of Jesus that does then too? You see, one of the first things that you need to understand, and it cannot, 
cannot be overemphasized. It's one of the leading causes, one of the introductory aspects. It's pornography. If we are to address the concern, this is a real and concrete way that it must happen. Pornography is a cancer. Or as a couple of our team members put it so well, Pete Peters said, porn is so pervasive, so graphic, that it must have a profound effect on enticing many Johns. And there are undoubtedly many porn watchers sitting in our pews. Aaron Shipley rightly said, pornography is a gateway drug that eventually feeds the, the demands for the sex trade. It is not a victimless crime. It is not a victimless endeavor. You think no one else is watching or no one else is affected by private viewing? You are wrong, and you are wrong because you are part of the body of Christ, and the rest of us are a part of it. And when one part of the body of Christ is wrong, it affects the rest. Pornography produces lust. And when lust is there, we cease to see women as women and simply as objects. If pornography is a part of your lifestyle, you need to change that lifestyle and get help. And it is an addiction. And it can be addressed and changed. And it must be addressed and changed. For like Aaron so well put it, seldom stays where it is. When pornography is in use, it's so much easier to start looking at other women with a desire that is not godly. To make that as a part of your, your daily routine, as your habit, as, as a simply that is the way that you operate until you don't even see it anymore. You don't even realize that you're not looking at the woman as a godly woman, but a wonderment and wondering what she looks like naked, how she would carry out sex. Gentlemen, I see the statistics. And I guarantee there's many in here that struggle with this. And I know for many it is a struggle, and I praise God for that. If it's not a struggle, you best examine yourself before the Lord. There is grace, there is forgiveness, but you need to get help because it is not acceptable and it seldom ends there. Let me switch on the other side. Ladies, you have no clue. You have no clue on what lust is like for men. You don't. You may think you do, you don't. Modesty is not just godly, but it is helpful for the body of Christ. It is necessary for the body of Christ. You do not entice others to sin, even just with their eyes. It's difficult enough in our society with our shows, with our commercials, with, with the way that everything is put forth, it is difficult enough 
for men to keep pure in their thoughts. I don't need your help. I need your help to get away from that. The next aspect of what are some things that need to happen to see this changed? This one's a difficult one, too. And it's a heart-wrenching one. You need to report domestic abuse, especially uh, child abuse and sexual assault. The grand number of girls that are brought into the trade are usually runaways and ones who have been abused. And if there is anything that prepares a girl better for a life of being a sexual slave, it is that indoctrination by fathers who abuse. They already start her down the path with the feeling that it's okay. Most certainly it's not. Upbring, or Lutheran Social Services at the South as they've rebranded themselves, CPS, DFPS, 911. Let me tell you, if you are in a household where abuse is taking place, if you know of a household where abuse is taking place, you must report it. And let me tell you something. Every pastor, every teacher are mandated reporters. You come and tell us, we will report it and we will help you through it. And if you're the one doing the abuse, get help now. Even if it's behind bars for a while. That might be just what you need. Still forgiveness. Cannot continue. It must not continue. You need to get involved, even if in some small ways. I know just for Elijah Rising, there's tons of agencies that do things. Elijah Rising has call centers. They, they have Fourth Friday outreaches. They train hotel staff what to look for. They do direct outreach to women in some of the brothels, to the men who attend. They have prayer groups and prayer time. The Freedom Church Alliance has opportunities to be able to help. There's a lot of things to do with varying levels. Some of them are dangerous and some are not. But all are needed. even if small. Elijah Rising also just recently have purchased an old Christian college down in Kendleton. And they purchased this and it has dorms and it has uh, some apartments and it has classrooms, it has a gymnasium, it has an, an auto repair shop uh, where they used to teach on that, it has, has some stables and is by a river. It's a beautiful place, 85 acres. And they took this and they, they put in a very low bid and it was accepted and they raised some money and, and our team and our board of directors were very kind in, in allowing a gift. Yesterday, they're having on every Saturday, they're having some time down there to help clean up because there's a lot of cleanup that needs to be done. But I got to go down there and take a representative for Elijah Rising and hand them a check from St. Mark. Her name was Susie, one of the people who works at Elijah Rising, and I got to extend to them the greetings and well wishes for St. Mark Lutheran and give them a $15,000 check in their work for this area, this area where they want to have 
rescued girls and women, not only to heal, but to have, learn a skill to be able to enter environments to learn about the Lord Jesus, have a Christian situation where they can do this. Because although there are other places that do that in the Houston area, they are all full. What does that tell you? And those are just the ones that are rescued. Those are just the ones who can. And so as we have mentioned as a congregation, we say, hey, you know what? We don't want to just give money. We want to get our hands dirty. We want to actually serve in addition. So we're going to be taking some names, those who want to get involved in the ministry and those who want to be involved in helping out here at Kendleton Farms. I took some pictures yesterday in some of the buildings. This is one of the, the main buildings here in the front of it that faces the road. There's the back and in, in part of one of the buildings where their cafeteria was. I had to break, slip my phone through a part of a break in a glass to be able to get that one. Here's the gymnasium that leads tons of work. Right now, some of the local farmers in the area are storing some of their equipment there. Some stables that are being cleaned up. No, there are no horses right now. There's still, uh, although I noticed in some places, um, evidence of where some were. This is the back, that's the main building over there. This is one of the apartment areas and buildings that they were doing work on yesterday. There's a couple of those around. They were laying floor, doing some painting, getting out old fixtures and the like. This is another one of the dorms right here. And back here is where they would teach uh, how to, to work on vehicles, or, you know, shop, auto uh, a shop. That building right there, here's a closer look, uh, needs a lot of work. There are many ways to get involved. But the biggest, the most important way to address any of it, you must address the heart first. There's a man who was walking along the side of the seashore and there were You've all heard this before. There were starfish out, and without them being in water, they die. And, and they were just littered with him, and he was just walking along the beach and tossing them back in. And someone said, dude, there's no way you're going to be able to address all of them. There's no, I mean, you can't make it. You're not going to make a difference. There's just too many. And he picked up another one, threw it in. He says, it made a difference for that one. Make a difference for one. Get on your knees in prayer with me. Grieve. Celebrate. Take joy in those who are rescued. Encounter in the dark places. Address the darkness. We have not been given a spirit of timidity, but a boldness. We do not fear what man can do to us. At worst, he can only send me to see my Lord sooner. For a closing prayer, I have from Psalm 10. Oh Lord, you hear, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed so that man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. Let it be, Lord. Amen. Finally, I leave you with a quote from William Wilberforce, who was instrumental after a long, hard, drawn-out fight, was instrumental in abolishing the slave trade in all of the United Kingdom. And he said, you may choose to look the other way, but you can never say again that you did not know. You know. Don't look the other way. Rest in the forgiveness and salvation of Christ. 
and let's take it into this dark place. Amen.